Last time we saw an example of a greedy algorithm. Greedy algorithms are sometimes called hill climbing algorithms because the idea is you're climbing up sort of the hill of optimization. So you have some space of possible solutions and each possible solution has a value and you're trying to optimize this value. So what that looks like is some sort of landscape sitting above this space of solutions. And hill climbing means you just climb uphill. So greedy or hill climbing algorithms work when the landscape looks kind of like this. There's one single big hill and climbing up will just take you straight to the top. When greedy algorithms don't work is when the landscape is more complicated, like maybe there's a little uh, peak here, which is not the highest peak, but if you just climb uphill, you might get stuck here. But sometimes the obvious greedy algorithm doesn't work, but you can modify it, which means modifying the landscape or modifying slightly how you walk around the landscape so that a slightly less obvious greedy algorithm does work. And that's what we'll see now. The problem we're gonna look at is called the maximum flow problem or max flow. The input here will be a graph, something like this, with directed edges now. And on every edge, there's a capacity. So you think of these as something like roadways or pipes, right? But if they're pipes, it's important, the direction is important. So you imagine there's a little valve at the beginning or end of the pipe, so water can only flow in one direction. And we'll also have a source vertex and a target vertex. So this is what an input to this problem might look like. And the goal is to essentially push water through these pipes without exceeding their capacities, but in such a way that you maximize how much water is flowing from S to T. So in this example, it's not hard to see that the best we can do is four units of water. We can pump two units of water through these two edges, and we can pump two units of water through these two edges for four units of water. So we haven't exceeded the capacity of any edge, and it's not hard to convince yourself that on this graph you can't do any better. Okay, so now let's look at a simple greedy algorithm for this that initially is going to fail. Our algorithm is going to be find any edge that has excess capacity. So we're gonna build up our flow sort of piece by piece, and excess capacity means you've, you've put some flow on an edge, but the capacity is larger than the flow you've put so far. Find any edge that has excess capacity, uh, or really any path from S to T that has excess capacity, and put one more unit of flow on that path. So for example, we might start by putting one unit of flow there, Okay, so these two edges now have one unit of excess capacity that we haven't used yet. Okay, and we might put a flow here, right? And we're doing this greedily, so we have to pretend like we don't know what the answer is. We just have to look sort of arbitrarily for paths that have excess flow. Notice that this path now has excess flow of, excess capacity of one. So maybe in our next step, we put a unit of flow along this path. Now the issue is we're stuck in a local optimum. We've got three units of flow, but this edge now already has two units of flow on it, and this edge already has two units of flow on it. So we, we, there are no more paths from S to T that have any excess flow. So let's see what this looks like. Let's see what the landscape here actually looks like to see why we got stuck in this local optimum and how we might get out of it. So for this, I'm going to give variable names to every edge. So this will be A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. And the variable just represents how much flow I'm putting on the edge at any given time. So we have some constraints on these variables, right? We know, for example, that A can't be any more than 2. And we're talking about flows, and we said things have to flow forward, so also A has to be at least 0. Okay, and similarly, you get capacity constraints for all of these. Okay. And we also have constraints at each node, right? When water flows through pipes, the water coming into a node has to be the same as the water going out of a node. So at this node, we get the constraint that D must be equal to A plus C. And at this node, we get the constraint that B, the incoming flow, must be equal to C plus E. Okay, so we can now 
substitute these in and see what we're really working with here is just a three variable problem, which is nice because then we can visualize it with a graph. Okay, so we've now eliminated the variables B and D. We have three variables here. We can also eliminate some of these constraints. For example, we already know that all of our variables are non-negative. So if C plus E are non-negative and they're at most two, then that already implies that E is at most two. So we might as well ignore this constraint. That was redundant. And similarly, if A plus C is at most two and they're non-negative, then that also implies that A is at most two. Okay. So we now have three variables and three constraints. And let's see what this looks like. Okay, so here we have our three variables, A, C, and E. C is between zero and one. So C, let's say this is one. So C has to live in this little strip. Um, C plus E is at most two. So that means whatever E is, it has to live in this region. Okay. And similarly, A plus C is at most two. So when C is zero, A can be two. And when C is one, okay, so this is sort of the outline of our region. And if you follow out what this can look like, it ends up looking like this funny shape. Okay. And remember, we said the optimum was when you're pushing two here and two here. So that's like A is two and E is two and C is zero. So that's this point. We're trying to get to the optimum. And now let's see what are the moves that we've allowed ourselves to make. So we start out with no flow anywhere. So we start out at zero, zero, zero. Well, one thing we could do is we could put one unit of flow along here. So that corresponds to moving that way, one unit. Okay. Another thing we could do starting from zero is we could put one unit of flow along this middle edge or along this path. So that corresponds to moving this way. And similarly, we could add one unit of flow to A and D, which corresponds to moving this way. Okay, and if you draw out this graph of the moves you're allowed to make, it ends up looking like this. All right, that wasn't very clear, so I've redrawn it here to make it a little clearer. The thing to notice is at this point, all of the edges are coming in. So all of the moves you can make from this point lead you here, and then you're stuck. And this is precisely the local optimum we got stuck in. As soon as you decide to put one unit of flow along C, that corresponds to taking one of these four edges, and then you're over here in this face. And when you're in this face, the only place you can end up, no matter what direction you go in, is here. And then you're stuck. And that's precisely what happened. So here we see we have a landscape. This is the global optimum, where you're pushing two along here and two along here. But we got stuck in this local optimum. But we only got stuck because we limited ourselves in the choice of moves. So I can instead allow myself to make a slightly different kind of move, which is I'm now going to allow myself to push water the reverse way along an edge as long as I had capacity there. So I can never have negative flow in an edge, but once I've put one flow here, then I can then push flow back that way and let it cancel out. So this is a new kind of move that I'm going to allow myself. And you can see if I do that here, let me put the canceling flow in red, I can then push flow like this. The flow this way and the flow this way cancel out. A now has two units of flow going. D now has two units of flow, B has two units of flow, and E has two units of flow, which is the optimum solution. And there's actually a theorem which says if you allow yourself this type of move, the greedy algorithm always works. No matter what you do, you end up at the global optimum. And let's see what happens in our graph when we allow that move. What is this move? Well, this is the move where you're starting out in a point in this face, right? And say what we had here was this point where we were stuck in our local optimum. And this move increases A by 1, decreases C by 1, and increases E by 1. So from here, it decreases C by 1, so it moves back to the AE plane. And it increases A, and it increases E. So that move is precisely this move from what used to be our local optimum where we got stuck to, in fact, the global optimum. 
But even if we hadn't put those there, we've also added a bunch of similar moves which look like this. So if you were here, you could also have moved here, and then you could move that way to the global optimum. Uh, if you were here, you could move here, and then up to the global optimum. And if you were here, you could move here, and then again up to the global optimum. So what we did here, by changing the allowable moves while still respecting the constraints, right? we were never allowed to put a total negative flow on an edge. But if we had some flow, we could cancel it out. So by respecting, respecting the constraints, we stay within the region of allowable flows. But by increasing the moves we're allowed to make, we literally reorganize our landscape so that what was a local optimum is no longer because there's now actually a path that still gets you to the global optimum. So the idea of greedy, while at first it seems like, oh, it's just hill climbing. So if my landscape is very complicated, then greedy isn't going to work. Sometimes that's true, but sometimes it just means you need to look for a more clever greedy algorithm to reorganize your landscape.